Thank you. It's great to be back. I um, think that I think that all writers um, eventually want to go back to the place where they came from. In this case, it was for me to go back to Memphis, Tennessee, where I grew up, where I was born, to try to understand this pivotal moment in American history, um, and to try to understand and sort of deconstruct the most controversial, the most tragic, um, the most, in many ways, complicated event in my city's history. My father was a law professor and a, and a, a, a lawyer at a law firm there in Memphis that had represented the garbage workers and represented King when he came on behalf of the garbage workers. And so I, I got a lot from him about this event. Um, but you know, you're always sifting your memory of things. You wonder, was the family lore correct? Did you, did you hear the story correctly? You were always wanting to test your memories against um, the, the hard, cold documents. Um, but you know, coming back to Memphis was also the idea of coming back to the place where I came from uh, in terms of literature. The first writer that I ever met growing up in Memphis um, was the great Civil War historian from the Ken Burns documentary. You may remember him, Shelby Foote, the guy with the beard and the pipe. He looked like a, he looked like a writer. He, he talked like a writer. He smelled like a writer. He was um, straight out of central casting. And, and he really gave me some very interesting ideas early on in life about what narrative history can be and what it can aspire to be. He, um, of course, um, came to history kind of through the back door. He was a novelist from the Mississippi Delta and uh, came to it late in life with the idea of trying to make history alive on the page. He thought history could be deadly dull the way it was often written in academic situations, academic uh, uh, settings. And uh, that's certainly what I found when I went off to college. I went to Yale, I studied history, one of the great heavyweight departments, wonderful historians, wonderful writers, but it was, it could be deadly dull. Um, I don't really remember the word pleasure like ever being used, like ever, to describe how you know, reading a history text could be. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, like we were historians. Historians are people who were put on robes, and uh, we were arch druids basically, and we go commune with dead people um, who can't talk back, and this is a very deadly serious business. So it took me a while, you know, to go out into the world and to learn how to write stories as a journalist before I began to see that, and, and began to read people like Shelby Foote and uh, Barbara Tuckman and some of the great na narrative historians to see, you know, that there's another way to, to, to skin this cat. Um, <clears throat> Shelby Foote, though, you know, the reason I know Shelby Foote is that his son, Huggy, um, the names are a little strange in the Deep South. Um, Huggy and I were in a rock band together, and it was called Argus. And we uh, basically did everything we could possibly do to prevent Shelby Foote from finishing his 6,000 page trilogy of the Civil War. You know, we were cranking up the Jimi Hendrix and the Pink Floyd, and uh, there may or may not have been smoke in the room. I'm not at liberty to say, but we. Um, we certainly were having a good time when, when Hug, uh, you know, Huggy would be in, lapsed in some sort of feedback reverie and Shelby would knock on the door and say, uh, you know, Huggy, turn that racket down. I'm working on Appomattox. And uh, you yeah, were like, right, sure. Um, of course, he was working on App Appomattox and he was working on this amazing 6,000-page uh, trilogy, which took many years for me to understand and, and uh, absorb. And, and so coming back to Memphis, I mean, Memphis is just this extraordinary city perched on the racial fault line. Uh, it's the capital of cotton. It's the capital of the Mississippi Delta. It's the capital of rock and roll and, and blues. And, uh, and of course, Beale Street is there. Um, of course, Elvis got his start there. Uh, but it's also uh, a place, you know, it's the, one of the very few uh, cities of any size in America that's named after an African capital with all this heavy Egyptian uh, mythology around it. Um, so it seemed, as I grew up and began to think about the King assassination, it seemed almost scripted by fate that King would be killed there. You know, this is a man who traveled nonstop for, for, for over a decade. He could have been killed in Anaheim. He could have been killed in Akron, Ohio. 
He was killed in Memphis, um, the, the, the capital of the blues. Um, so I began to kind of think about that. I began to think about how do I make a book here that is, in, in which Memphis is a character, in which you begin to understand the confluence of things that brought King to Memphis, the garbage strike being the most obvious one, but um, the whole background, the whole backdrop of Memphis. He had come to Memphis really because he was uh, uh, re beginning to recruit for this very ambitious and very controversial campaign called the Poor People's Campaign in Washington. Uh, the idea was to take thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of poor people, African Americans, but also from other backgrounds, to Washington and to build this shanty town on the mall to protest multi-generational poverty, systemic poverty. It was a very controversial plan. Uh, he was getting a lot of criticism and of course our good friend J. Edgar Hoover was um, very suspicious of this thing. He, he thought it was communism. He thought he was uh, some sort of uh, subversive. Um, he had, to, but King sort of made this left turn into Memphis when he heard about this garbage strike because uh, it seemed like the perfect local indigenous expression of what he was trying to do in Washington. These were garbage workers, almost entirely African American workforce. Most of them were former sharecroppers from the Mississippi Delta, the poorest part of the United States. Um, and it's, it, it made perfect sense for him to go to Memphis and try to sort of represent their cause, even though his staff, the inner circle of, of the uh, SCLC uh, said, this is a trap, you don't want to do this, this is a mistake, we need to go to Washington, you're making a left turn into Memphis. Uh, but he said, no, we've got to do this. Um, this is uh, the perfect illustration of what we're trying to do up in Washington on a local scale. So he comes to Memphis and uh, marches down Beale Street, which those of you who've been to Memphis know it's now become kind of uh, the Bourbon Street of, of uh, farther up the Delta. Um, it's certainly um, overcrowded and overdone now, but it was the you know classic um, avenue of Black America for for over a century. And I want to read a little passage from the book that has to do with the march that King led down Beale Street. It started off well, but things turned awry it became clear that uh, the march was taken over by um, some young radicals who had different ideas about nonviolence, who had uh, different ideas about uh, which way the civil rights movement should go. And because of that, um, because of this violence that, that breaks out and the looting and the rioting and the police sort of uh, crack down on it, um, because of that, King realizes he's got to come back to Memphis yet again to try to sort of uh, redeem himself and his reputation and to prove to the nation that he can lead a nonviolent march. Okay, so this is March 28th, uh, about a week or so before the assassination. And he and uh, his inner circle, Abernathy, Lee, and a local minister named Lawson are marching down Beale Street. And um, things are starting to go awry. The march began. King, Abernathy, Lee, and Lawson locked arms in the front and began walking as police hel helicopters whirred overhead. They left Claiborne Temple and slogged along Hernando Street for a few blocks, jerking and halting, trying to find the right pace. Then they turned left onto Beale the Avenue of the Blues, and marched west in the direction of the Mississippi River. In the rear, no one bothered to form orderly lines. The kids were jostling and shoving, sending forward wave after wave of people stumbling and stepping on heels. Make the crowd stop pushing, King yelled. We're going to be trampled. Soon they passed W.C. Handy Park, named for the prosperous band leader and composer who first wrote down the blues and shaped the form into an internationally recognized genre. As it happened, this very day was the 10th anniversary of W.C. Handy's death, and someone had laid a wreath beside the bronze statue of the beaming bluesman standing with his trumpet at the ready. But this Beale 
was a faded version of the street that the father of the blues had known. Had he been alive to see it now, he would have despaired at its mirthless state. 